Hi, this is Jacob Yaffe. And this is Ron Hilton. And you're listening to The Sound Architect Podcast. Hello, and welcome to The Sound Architect Podcast. I am your host, Sam Hughes, and today I am joined by composers Jacob Yaffe and Ron Hilton. Welcome to the show, guys. It's a pleasure to have you. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for having us. No, it's an absolute pleasure. So before we discuss your recent projects, how did you two first get into composition? And I really want to hear about how the two of you first began collaborating. Well, it's interesting. This this uh, question has come up for us a bit, um, and we always have this saying that a composer is made, not born. And in my case, um, I'd been working um, on the pop and urban uh, music business side, uh, making music for radio, record labels, nice. various artists. Um, and quite frankly, I just wanted a new challenge. I'd been trying a couple of different things. Um, and, you know, fortuitously, I went to a trip on a trip to a conference in Israel. And there, Jacob and I met, just hit it off. Um, we're looking for ways to collaborate. Um, and we just found some amazing projects. And it was like we like to say the next logical step. Yeah, I uh, started uh, music piano lessons like a lot of uh, kids growing up and I remember specifically when I was eight years old I was watching Gremlins with my family and I looked at my mom amazing and I said movie. amazing <laughs> yeah Jerry Goldsmith score uh, fantastic and mm. I knew then that I wanted to do music for movies and television and I didn't care how I was going to get there I just wanted to be involved and then I went to a conservatory to study composition for orchestra, and my plan was, okay, I'm going to learn how to write for the orchestra properly, and then move to LA and, and dive in. Uh, but when I got there, I heard jazz for the first time, and everything in my life completely changed. I said, what is that? I need to, I need to figure that out. I totally forgot about film and television and pop music and everything else dove into that music for about 10 years and then gradually came back to film through friends in new york that just kind of pulled got me excited about it again uh, then after i got a master's from nyu moved to la and then i think five years later is when the two of us met and things have just taken off since then that's awesome so you're both from very contrasting backgrounds then uh, yeah definitely so I'm really curious, how do you two work together as a duo? Like, who, how do you decide who does what? Or do you work on the same stuff? Or how does it work? We like to say every project's its own world. Um, but we've also noticed um, with all the projects that we've done that our best work is usually when we're sitting side by side, um, kind of brainstorming as two brains, uh, passing ideas back and forth. I may start something and I hate it. And then he's like, no, 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 that right there. <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> he'll, he'll have something that he's done or, or start something and be like, man, this is awful. It's not working. Um, and then I'll just hear something and it'll spark uh, the whole uh, cycle of creativity. And that's how we do. We just bounce back ideas off of each other. You know, two people working together, you would think, oh, that's perfect. Because then you guys each only have to do half the work. And we've been interviewed by a couple other podcasts and, and TV shows, and they say, oh, most duos, you guys say, okay, there's, you know, 60 cues uh, for this project. Okay, you do 30, I'll do the other 30, and then we'll be finished. We'll meet you at the finish line. That never works, because it seems like whenever we get hired, they really only like the music we've done together. So if, if it's something that I do by myself or something he does by himself, it seems like they know and they kick it back and say, this one here, it sounds a little wonky. It's something's off. And so we really uh, are getting hired because of the collaboration. So we sit side by side. Um, he'll either run the computer or I'll run the computer or he's sitting at the keyboard. I'm sitting at the keyboard. Um, and we just work it out. Sometimes a piece of music will be done in an hour. Sometimes it takes days. Uh, it's just all about the inspiration and just getting it to feel right. Yeah, that's amazing, though. Like you say, usually people will split the workload or, you know, try and take a track each or something and, and alternate. But the fact that you guys work together so so well and fluidly is is really nice and really unique. It is. Yeah, we're pretty grateful for that. And uh, as a composer, I've never really been in a situation where I was, I don't, I don't think I was very good at collaborating until I met Ron. Up until now, I've been pretty much a control freak over every element. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's been a, a big change for me. Yeah, I can imagine. And I'm still thinking as well. So what is your day to day like? Do you both turn up at the same time? You sit down and go, right, what are we doing today? 
Well, I'm I'm a super night owl, and he's a super morning person. <laughs> so our day to day, you know, if there's a new project, we'll you know sit in front of picture, we'll look at it, take notes. Um, then we may go through pre-existing stuff that we have or just get inspired by music that we both like. Um, just get ideas, get the creative juices flowing. Um, and then we'll just dive in. We'll find, you know, things that work uh, for what we're particularly working on at that time and literally just cre- keep on doing that creative process until we get up the mountain because it is definitely a mountain of work. Yeah, definitely. One of the coolest things, because uh, I just had this thought, was, you know, he said, pull from pre-existing music that maybe each of us has created. Um, That's one really interesting thing because he's got thousands of tracks that he has started or even finished on his hard drive from all the years he's been doing this. I have thousands of compositions and pieces that are on my hard drives so we can inspire each other with older pieces. But then he also listens to completely different types of music than I do. So we get together and we watch something and I'm like, you know what? We should go listen to the cello concerto by William Walton. And he's like, who the hell is that? And then we listen to it and he goes, wow, that's amazing. We should go check out this DJ named Girl Talk. And then we start, you know, we inspire each other with completely disparate starting points. And it does truly create something new and exciting. And that I think is why we're getting hired by filmmakers because it is different. Yeah. Yeah. Our our, yeah. Inter, our internal jute boxes, I like to say, are completely stocked with different music. And those melody ideas, when they come together, is, is just something that's new and different. Amazing. Yeah. Because I was going to ask how you inspire each other, but how does your backgrounds influence how you work with each other as well? Like from the hip hop background to the um, classical background, for example. I would say for me, when I really first started diving into film and and television, I thought it was going to be easy to be able to just draw from that experience, the production instincts, the songwriting instincts. Um, but the truth of the matter is, you know, what you do in film composing is really serving the picture, right? The the picture is the most important thing. So you don't want to do things that stand out that, you know, too much. You don't want to have just a crazy track that you're like, Oh, that track is awesome. You know, you want something that really serves on what you're seeing on screen. And so for me, what what it was was more so a melodic instinct, being able to stretch out melody, um, being able to feel the emotion of what needs, uh, what we need to end up, um, and eventually get there. Um, but it took some, it took some doing, it took some throwing some paint on the wall, if you will. Um, but I think those instincts eventually have made me a better composer for sure. Yeah, I can imagine. And what about you, Jacob? I think that our backgrounds definitely influence each other. And again, um, the thing that I have found most interesting and humbling is how subjective all experiences truly are as human beings. And we sit side by side and we'll watch the picture or we'll, we'll have a phone call or a conference with the producer or the director of something. And we'll take notes and then we'll we'll finish the call, we'll hang up. And then the two of us talk and I say, yeah, I think what we should do is this. And he goes, really? I had the complete opposite uh, feeling. I feel like we should do this. And then we start watching the picture and I say, okay, right here, I feel like we should kind of get really sad or emotional this moment. He's like, no, right there, we should go hard. We need to hit like 808 bass or we need to kind of drop, drop the beat there. And what I've learned is to let go and try his ideas. He's let go and tried my ideas and we meet in the middle. And I think that is what has been eye-opening for me because you you start to develop kind of like a confidence in how you see the picture and you feel things. Yeah. And yeah. what's really interesting is that I'm wrong a lot of the time. And <laughs> um, he can be wrong a lot of the time. But with the two of us here, we usually find what is uh, kind of the most exciting in the filmmaker's um, are happy and sometimes we're both wrong and they they tell us the way they want it um, but as far as inspiring each other I think that's kind of what we do is we say hey let's try this approach let's try that and then the fun part is producing the music after that how well we can do it you know there are, I have certain strengths writing for specific instruments or different styles he obviously has strengths writing for different instruments styles and vocalists and uh, he's a whiz with working with singers in general. He kind of knows how to work with them, talk to them. Um, and then we both just get really excited when the music starts sounding great and big and full. And then when the filmmakers get excited, we feel great. 
So it's uh it's a lot of give and take at the beginning and then it's just downhill from there. I would say too to to be a little bit more specific about the question, um one of the things that I had to get cured cured of was perfectionism in the wrong ways. I think, um, hmm. for, you know, from from the radio background, you have three minutes and thirty seconds to make something perfect, right? So I would obsess about a kick drum, uh, a, a kick snare, the EQ of the the hi hat, and and Jacob's like, "Hey, bro, we don't have the time for that." <laughs> and like, and then uh, at first I didn't really understand it, right? Because I'm like, "What do you mean? We have we, we don't have time for perfectionism?" And then I realized, like, no, we have a thousand more of these three minute and thirty second <laughs> cues, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. I think that was one of the main th ways that I was inspired, I would say, is how I think about creating, right? Like how I think about producing and putting melodies together is that the melody is more important than how it sounds. You know what I mean? And right. I, I think those are two different um, stylistic things um, that, that have really inspired me. Yeah, there's. I want to say this too is, um, you know, getting into film, you're always going to give your absolute best. And they say you do, do the best you can with the time you're given. So it's not about cutting quarter, corners or not giving the highest quality. And the story that I was told a fr by a friend of mine who worked with Howard Shore on all three of the Lord of the Rings. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, nice. Scores. And I asked him, I said, how the hell did you guys maintain such high quality over the course of years working on that, that project? Because it's just like every one of those films, it's just fantastic. And the score's amazing and it's timeless. People are still studying it. There's books being written about it. There's, you know, obviously a lot of references. And then we had the three follow-up Hobbit films. And he said, are you kidding me? We were so exhausted. He's like, everybody was maybe running at 60% capacity by the end. And he says, the thing you do is you hire really good people so that even when they're only running on half, they're giving you high quality stuff. And I think that's yeah. really the, the secret there. You feel bad because you're not at 100%, but that's why they called you because your 50% is still really good. Awesome. And how do you get your 50% to be that good? Reps. Reps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reps. Take, take as many shots as possible, you know, just keep on doing it, keep on doing it. And then eventually you're, you trust your instinct and you just go even on zero hours of sleep over 48 hours <laughs> and your choices, yeah. your choices get better and better and better. Or maybe your confidence in those choices yep. is, is more acute. And um, yeah, more specifically, they're not going to let something that sucks go through. Like right. there are so many mm. boundaries for the composer. I read an interview with Trent Reznor recently, and he was talking about how picture editors are the sort of gateway you have to break through. Um, and that's totally true. We will send music. And if the picture editors don't like it, they kind of can very easily be passive aggressive and just not bring your music into the edit or put the same oh, wow. one in over 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 the one that they like yeah so you have <laughs> you have the first the first wall is getting the picture editor to agree that they like your your music so they put it in so that the d director can even judge it the director has to like it the producers have to like it the network has to like it uh and if someone doesn't like it along the way you will hear about it so oh, yeah. um i feel like there's always this nice um, feeling that you're going to be fact checked along the way. And if it makes it through all those people, then it's it's going to be good. It's going to work. OK, cool. And I only have one more question about working as a duo before we start talking about your your recent work on Age of AI. Um, I'm wondering, how was it in the beginning? Like when you first start collaborating with someone, there must have been some like learning curves. And then before you settled into the flow. Yes, there was there was a lot. Um, you want to go first? <laughs> I mean, I think I personally think that it's always a learning experience. Like every every experience is its own universe. Like we literally always say that. But our very very first project, um, we worked on a Gap commercial with Janelle Monae, uh, featuring Jan mm. Janelle Monae, and it kind of really suited um, both of our strengths. And then the first film project we did was Best Shot, um, you know, which was produced by LeBron James. Um, and so it, it, again, it was 
really uniquely set for both of our skill sets. For me, um, I just did what I normally did. I locked in with a, a lot of musicians and artists and collaborators that I knew and just created. Um, but for me, the learning process from there was taking the, the things that we created and really making them work to picture. I think that was the biggest learning curve for me is not just producing songs over and over and over and over again and making them long. It was literally mm. making cues. And then um, the next stage of that is us as two individual creators who've been creating for over 20 years each um, being able to trust each other's, you know, production flow and learning how to integrate each other's production flow together. Um, and yes, though, though it was a learning process, I think what we um, uniquely do, it, it kind of just worked. And even though, even though, um, you know, we had to have two different computers, two different sets of hard drives, two different ideas. We kind of just got in the process and it just became easier and easier every project we did. Nice. There's a big difference between um, pop or basically film music and everything else. Uh, all other kinds of music, they can just put a lot of processing on the two track out. And there's a lot of compression, EQ, effects, whatever it is. You can just really kind of live and die by that two track out. Unfortunately, yeah. with film, they demand the stems. Uh, and so one of the things we started to do was like, you know, getting all of the like if he had stuff on in his session, we had to build a process for him to get that out to get into my session so we could add other layers or tweak it to picture. And uh, once that was one hurdle, but once we figured out a quick process for that, because when we're passing stuff back and forth to each other, really quickly you're using you know four or five hundred gigabytes of hard drive space for one project and uh yeah yeah so we had to figure out a, a way to kind of make it a little more efficient but along the way we were learning a lot from each other because when you're just seeing like the the vulnerable insides of someone's music making you really quickly sort of start to figure out like oh that's how this piece of music worked that's how it's built that's how you get that kind of sound that's how the mix sort of sits well and um so I think that there were a couple of times at the beginning, maybe it felt like we were taking two steps back, but then we would launch three steps forward. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you figured it all out because you guys keep getting gigs, right? So it must be working well. Yeah. Well, let's see. It's the beginning of the year. <laughs> I know, right? We're on, uh, we're on a, a series right now. We, I don't think we can talk about it, but um, we're hoping to get a couple more. It'd be nice to continue working through this year and not be done in March and sitting around twiddling our thumbs. <laughs> That's always the plan, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So speaking about one of those projects, let's talk about the Age of AI, which is a recent YouTube original series you just scored. How did that first come about? Well, again, I, I had previously mentioned a project called Best Shot, produced by LeBron James um, on YouTube right. Originals. Um, we had just finished that project, and we were at the rap party, um, and some of the executives from YouTube just really, really, really um, wanted to bring us in on a couple of other projects. Um, and so, again, we worked again with YouTube on another project called Sherwood. Um, and after that closed out, um, we were brought in uh, for Age of AI. And uh, we've just been working on it until we finished it. And it was it was a nice long process, but we were very happy with the results. It was about eight months and, uh, for us. They had been working on it for way longer than A us. year and a half, uh, total two years or something. And they had so much footage to sift through because they, you know, obviously filmed way more than ended up in the final series. And yeah. when, when they began, the company was had been accustomed to just using music libraries and YouTube um, and Team Downey, Robert Downey Jr.'s production company. Um, they they weren't happy with that approach. They weren't happy with the music sound and they wanted um, something just a little different, more fresh. Uh, so YouTube suggested that they hire us. So when they heard our music, they, they gave us a shot and uh, we kept going. Um, we had to write a lot of music uh, for this show, a lot of different types of music, because it's not just a scripted narrative or even the same people in every episode. It, it really demanded a wide palette. Each episode has at least three different stories in it. Um, so there was a lot of different types of music that we needed to do. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so you didn't have to pitch for it. They chose you based on your previous work. Correct. And then they wanted to hear, we had to send them a couple thousand tracks from our back catalog. A couple of thousand? Yes. They, uh, <laughs> because the picture editors needed, 
needed our music to cut with right away because the the sound hadn't been solidified. They had to see what's really working with the footage. And they didn't know they didn't have an order or a sequence of which um, you know, which different vignettes were gonna go together. Yeah. Wow, that's quite a pressure though. Like can you give us the last two thousand tracks you have lying around? Yeah, so we had to really quickly build an online music library so they could have access to it and then try to meta tag the stuff really quickly, all while writing new original music for them at the same time. And the editors were really, everybody was really stressed because there was just so much work to be done and everything you're doing is being judged and, okay, that's not working, try something else, let's start from ground zero. And of course, of course, all the new stuff that we did in the end end up working the best. Mm -hmm. um, the sound definitely developed, you know, this has also been often the case for us that the sound doesn't truly crystallize until the project's about done. Um, but it was the new music that really got us through uh, the last major bit of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did they give you, um, so they give you all the episodes in one go once you got the gig or did they just give you kind of the first few or? Oh, no. Few? Thank God. No, <laughs> there were no episodes at first. We got little se sequences like, Hey, here's, here's raw footage of like a, you know, just talking heads interviews. Here's like a, a three or four minute sequence about, you know, farming. Here's a sequence about, <laughs> you know, the firemen using AI. Uh, and so you just kind of get a vibe and they would have um, music library stuff in there. And they say, hey, uh, yeah, so everybody hates this music. What do you guys think you should do? Uh, and then we would send them stuff and then the editors, you know, wouldn't like it. Uh, or the editors would put it in and then someone else somewhere else would say, oh, we don't like the edit or the music. So you guys got to start over. Um, I mean, God. yeah, and a lot of the stuff we scored to picture just wasn't didn't even end up in the show. It for it was months and months till we finally found the sound because, oddly enough, when we first got the call, they told us we want this score to be the like the music of Stranger Things mixed with John Williams' E.T. score, which we were like, hell yeah, that oh, sounds yeah. amazing. Right. So we we started writing all this stuff like that. We were like, this is going to be incredible, and they were like, okay. That's not working at all. Everyone hates the the music of the Stranger Things with this series. It's just not working. It's too electronic. Um, this is actually a very human show, even though it's about AI. We want to show how it's augmenting humanity and not replacing humanity. And if it's right. too electronic and techy, it just kills the whole energy of it. But then when we did straight orchestra, they were like, this sounds too wimpy or dull. Uh, and then when we did rock pop or hip-hop they were like this just sounds like diners drive-ins and or cooking shows or just like you know <laughs> pawn shop guy it just sounded like reality t television and they everybody hated that so we were like yeah. oh man what do we do and they were like can you just mix all of that together please and we were like yeah coming right up coming right up <laughs> so yeah we had to we had to basically just remove the idea that it was all tech and just think about craft and craftsmanship and the idea of ideas churning thoughts and you know a person sitting in a room working on something over again kind of like someone working on maintaining their motorcycle you have to really keep your gumption you have to really keep your wits about you and not give up over many 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 days many hours uh, and that kind of feeling so we said okay you know let's mix strings with some synth arps and some drums and uh, of course, there were times where they just wanted big trailery orchestra stuff, but also times they wanted hip hop or rock stuff. Uh, but really, the running music was this kind of amalgamation of all the ideas mixed together. Wow, that's what a project to work on. It must have been so creatively challenging and satisfying at the end. Yeah, I would definitely say, as far as the arc of the shows that we've we've done, we we've we've been blessed, and I think this one was one that really allowed us to just figure it out, figure something we hadn't figured out before. But now that we've figured that out, it's like, okay, the next challenge, what's that going to be? What's the next mountain going to look like? Yeah, and would you say that you have like a a big moment in there that's like your proudest moment, like that you're like, yes. I would say, I, I would personally say, maybe maybe Jacob would feel the same, but when we finally got um, Robert Downey Jr. on screen and we 
got to figure out, we cracked the code kind of on what music was going to work for his face on screen. Because if, if you think about it, we had been working on this project for months before we got to see or hear anything from, from him. And he was kind of the glue that made all these different sequences make sense. I um, mean, we had scored a right. lot of it. Right. I would say we scored the majority of the show before we got those pieces. So when he comes in and adds this life, this energy that he, only he brings, um, then we're like, okay, this is a new challenge, right? We need to make sure that this glue does not, you know, we, we're not overstating it, but at the same time, we're like, you know, this is his first time on screen since Avengers. Like, how are we going to make this to where it's not too big, right? <laughs> no yeah, pressure. and then we're not going to make it so we have to rescore the whole show. Um, so I definitely think when when that came together, it was like, here we go, we finished it. Yeah, I admit we, the first time, uh, the first thing we got was the beginning of episode one, and it was the intro uh robert filmed and we wrote this big orchestral thing we were like oh my god it's tony stark it's iron man <laughs> we need to write something <laughs> awesome and it's like so big and this is like we're talking of any and even the things he's saying he's like it's the dawn of a new era artificial intelligence and we just went big and uh his his team the producers came over to the studio they were sitting behind us and they were like yeah that's really cool but like he doesn't want that. He's like, he knows he's not tiny Tony Stark in real life. He doesn't want to pretend that he thinks that. Um, he's actually really hilarious, and um, he's got a, a kind of swagger to him, and it's not like, he doesn't want to be like the superhero guy. So we had to really figure out, okay, how do we support the comedy? And then, um, so Rowan and I said, okay, how do we hit the comedy, but also give it like pulse and energy and not make it goofy? So we settled on the electric bass and uh, we had recorded it kind of like old school analog 70s style and once we brought that into the mix underneath Robert that was what clicked the producers liked it everybody liked it and we layered arps and, and strings and orchestra on top of that but that became kind of the centerpiece uh, and then we were able to build out the rest of the score once we found that sound like okay a little bit of comedy but some energy to it Man, it really does sound like such a creatively challenging project. <laughs> it's yeah, hard. So yeah. <laughs> looking back on it, you know, in the middle of it, we're like, man, this is, <laughs> this is interesting. But looking back on it, it's like, yo, that was definitely a, a, a mountain that we climbed. Yeah, you wouldn't think for like a, you know, a docu-series that these, you know, docu-series in general, I think, are we're kind of in a new, a new age of docu-series. People are putting more effort into them than ever. Uh, for many reasons, I think the streaming networks are choosing those. I think people are just very interested in it. I think it's cheaper for them to to green light some of these docu series that'll be really interesting to people um, rather than saying, "Okay, we're going to make ten Game of Thrones." Uh, yeah. Uh, but then it's like, how do you make it different from the last ten docu series that you've seen? So music is a big one. Um, and it's so subjective when you're just looking at someone talking on screen, you can put any piece of music you want. There's no, there's no filmic rules. You know, if you see a hobbit walking through Mordor, you kind of want to hear orchestra. You know what I mean? Like there's certain yeah. filmic, like knee jerk reactions, but with docuseries, it's like, yeah, anything can go, anything can go. And the picture editors, they kind of set the tone with the temp and. I mean, it's it's like the Wild West. Yeah, and I was going to ask, what was your biggest challenge on the project? You've already discussed quite a few, but was there one that really stood out as the most challenging moment on it? Yeah, I think there, there was, there's two things. One, being so close to the content. Um, I, I mean, we both love science fiction. Uh, we both love the actual ideas that the show is, is talking about. Um, actually, that's one of the things we, when we first met, we were talking about. We we're discussing aliens, AI, future of humanity, you know, those, those kind <laughs> nice. of typical music nerd things, right? But um, I think stepping back from, you know, what we're enjoying creatively about the show and finding what was actually going to work um, and what was going to make um, our producers, our editors, and the network um, feel real confident about the story that they were trying to tell. Um, and then also musically, right? Just finding what is going to sound correct 
um, for these things that we're seeing on screen. That whole combination, that gumbo, if you will, was overall the most challenging. But like you know, like mm. we've said, once we got in the rhythm, um, once things began to work, um, once we began to open up sessions that we had sent to them months before that weren't working, find out why they weren't working, um, and then reconnect with them, and we were able to create the rhythm and just you know hammer it out. These types of uh, shows are really difficult too because there were so many, you know, they say cooks in the kitchen. Uh, we had YouTube network executives, uh, Robert and his wife at Team Downey, their executives. Then you had Network Entertainment, which was the company in Vancouver uh, also making it. Uh, and then you had the team of up to, I think, eight or ten picture editors. And everybody was putting their energy into the show and their ideas and giving feedback. And as music people... We didn't even meet anyone in person until seven months into the project, I think. Oh, man. Yeah, everything is just phone conferences, much like we're talking with you. Um, emails, uh, some, in some cases, texts and phone calls with people. But you're, you're trying, it's like you're trying to work with someone very intimately from extreme distance. And it's sort of like the, the new way of making film and television because the deadlines are so fast. And um, so that, that became very challenging because you're trying, we're trying to guess from like cryptic emails, you know, okay, the picture editor says this or they're not liking this, but we got that note from Team Downey and they like this. And then, but YouTube called us and they said this. So you're like oh, trying man. to piece together. <laughs> And you're kind of caught in the middle a bit. And then you're also, you know, on any project, I, you probably speak with a lot of film composers, but they always say, figure out early on who's in charge. And um, this one was very difficult because we were like, well, who, who is the creative uh, lead? Yeah, who gets the final say? Yeah. And I don't think anyone was being um, sort of, no one, I don't think anyone was being like the rude sort of dictator on this, which ended up making the show great in the end. Um, yeah. you know, often on a film or a TV series, the showrunner, the producer, they sort of take, you know, okay, as long as so-and-so is happy, then everyone else just falls in line. Um, yeah, this one took a little bit to congeal. So that was really challenging for us to kind of figure out like which person or which sort of sound to, to follow after. And, but I think ultimately it benefited the show. It just took longer to find the sound. Well, it definitely sounds like one of the most interesting projects you'll ever work on. For sure. I agree. True. I agree. <laughs> For better or worse, yeah. Okay, so what else have you actually been working on recently as well? Actually, we have a show on Netflix right now. It premiered December 27th, and it's a really fun series with Kevin Hart. It's called Kevin Hart Don't F This Up. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's like a behind-the-scenes, really kind of intimate portrayal, or not portrayal, uh, look into his life. Uh, the, the, the show started... It's kind of like a, hey, follow Kevin Hart on tour with he and his friends as they get into shenanigans on the road with his stand-up comedy world tour. But they ended up catching on camera the moment he was hired to host the Oscars. They caught the affair with his wife. They caught arguments he had with his, oh, his wow. friends and everything. And they said, you know what, let's, let's make this more about cancel culture and sort of celebrity um, stresses and how it can pull apart marriages and all kinds of stuff. And then you come to find out his friend like framed him and like got him drugged so that he could get a prostitute to sleep. It was, there was some crazy stuff. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. It, musically, this is a huge contrast from the AI because um, musically, we just got to make some of the most fun music, you know, that musicians make, which is 70s <laughs> yeah. soul, uh, funk, R&B. Um, and given Jacob's background, he he had a whole bunch of musician friends um, to call um, real quickly that we could get this done. Um, and we had we had just finished working on another project last year called Free Meek. Uh, again, we were at the uh, rap party in New York. And so we just was like, hey, let's just record while we're here in New York. Uh, and I don't know if you've been to L.A. or New York, but the, the contrast in, in the way that people make music is, is quite different. So for us, leaving L.A. and being in New York and just getting to create in the studio, um, it, it set such a good tone for the music of this show. Um, and it allowed it to kind of 
you know, have this, this perfect marriage with the intensity of Kevin's life, you know, his natural humor, um, and the, just the drama that the story needed. So it was, this project was a lot of fun to do. Yeah, I can imagine. Actually, those are the only two places in the U.S. I have been. In New York <laughs> <and the Lake. laughs> yeah. Well done, sir. Yeah. So I have one final question then, if you can tell me. What else can we expect from you in 2020? Well, uh, we do have this one series that we're knee deep in, uh, working with a world famous uh, music artist and rapper. Uh, we're pretty excited about it. Musically, been a lot of fun. I wish we could say the artist, but I think we're um, bound. Uh, our, our, our hands are tied. Yeah, classic. Yeah, but we are really excited to explore some musical territory that's been bouncing around in our minds the last few years on uh, a personal project, something not tied to a film, not tied to a series. So we are working on our first album together as a, a duo artist, and we're going to call in lots of musician friends, vocalists. Uh, it's going to be a mixture of, you know, chamber, orchestra, pop music, hip hop, jazz. It's just going to be a whole meshing of the things that we love and just not have anything to restrict us. That sounds awesome. When's it, um, when are you aiming for release? Good question. <laughs> we, we have plans, but often, you know, we, to make a living, we we're scoring things. So we work on it when we can and we work hard. Yeah. But if a gig comes in and they say, we need this now, that stuff is the first to get put on the back burner. So we, of we, course, we yeah. hope by the end of 2020, it's finished and we can release the album and some, some music videos and all that kind of stuff. But uh, still only January. We don't know what's coming. We hope something good. Yeah, well, we hope so too. So fingers crossed and keep us posted. We will. So I have to say, Jacob and Rowan, it's been amazing having you on the show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Absolutely. Definitely. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. And actually, I do really want to check out Age of AI now just from hearing about the music for it. So I might have to go and check that out. Is it a YouTube original in terms of you have to subscribe or is it on the free service? It's free. Right now, the first four episodes are out front of the paywall. And then every week, uh, the next episode becomes free to view without any membership. Uh, and then oh, okay, cool. there are eight episodes total. So after you know two full months, I think by February 18th, all eight episodes will be out front of the paywall for, I'm not sure how long, but definitely for, uh, for a while. So I think right now the first, maybe even the first five episodes are free. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I'll have to check them out then. And we look forward to hearing more from you in 2020. Hope so. Thanks so much.